Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good day everyone. My name is Madam Najwa Binti Azizan and today we will be talking about the concept of statehood. Before we go into further details, at the end of this video, students must be able to describe the concept and criteria of statehood under international law. And this is the layout of today's discussion. First, we will define state and then we'll go into the concept of statehood and discuss the two theories, declarative theory and constitutive theory. State is one of the most important actors in international play, alongside with international organization, non-governmental organization, as well as multinational corporation. And state has legal personality, which means state is a subject of international law and they can enjoy rights, duties or powers established in international law. So in other words, the state can sue and state can be sued. Do you know how many states are there in the world today? According to the United Nations, we have 195 sovereign states. Now let's go to the definition of state. According to the Oxford Dictionary, a state is a nation or territory considered as an organized political community under one government. The most widely accepted source as to the definition of statehood is the Montevideo Convention on the Rights and Duties of States 1933, which we will be talking about it in a while. What constitutes state? Say, for example, if you want to create your own state today, can you? If yes, then how? So, in this issue, to constitute a state, we can look into two theories. Number one, declarative theory, and number two, constitutive theory. Under the declarative theory, an entity that satisfies the criteria of statehood as provided under Article 1 of the Montevideo Convention will be considered as a state. So the four requirements are number one, permanent population, number two, defined territory, number three, effective government, number four, capacity to enter into relations with other states. We'll discuss the first requirement, permanent population. There must be some population link to a specific piece of territory on a more or less permanent basis and who can be regarded as its inhabitants. That is why Antarctica is not known as a state because it does not have population. The same goes to wandering tribes. They do not qualify to be a state because the people move from one place to another. There is no ideal size of population. According to Aristotle, a population must be large enough to be self-sufficient, but small enough to be well-governed. A good population makes a good state, a bad one, a bad state. Take Nauru for example. Nauru in 2023 has only 12,731 citizens. Let's go to the second requirement under Article 1 of the Montevideo Convention, which is defined territory. So territory is defined by geographical areas separated by borderlines from the territories of other states. Territory refers to land surrounding water up to 3 nautical miles as well as the air above the land and water. There is no rule prescribing a minimum size of a territory. Size is not important but must have a clear core territory. Again, take Nauru for example. It only has 21 square kilometers of territory. Territorial sovereignty establishes exclusive competence of the state to exercise sovereign authority within territory and at the same time prohibiting foreign government from exercising authority in the same area. A defined territory does not suggest that the territory must be fixed and the boundaries be settled since these are not essential to the existence of the state. In other words, Absolute certainty about a state frontier is not required as long as the state consistently controls a sufficiently identifiable core of territory. Let's take example, border dispute between India and Pakistan over Jammu and Kashmir. It does not affect their status as states. There is no requirement that a territory should be a coherent one or confirmed to any particular form. For example, Bahamas comprise of 700 islands. 
The third requirement under Article 1 of the Montevideo Convention is effective government. The government must be effective within the defined territory and exercise control over the permanent population. So the mere existence of a government in itself does not suffice if there is no effective control. Say, for example, if the government in, uh, create a law, they must also have enough strength and power to enforce the law. For example, in Holland Island case, where the facts of the case was that Finland had been part of the Russian Empire until the Russian Revolution. The Finnish parliament declared Finland's independence on December 4th, 1917. This was recognized by Soviet government, but there was a position within Finland by those who rejected the independence. As a result, violence broke out for a time. The government of the new state was able to maintain order only with the help of the Soviet troops. So the court held that the exact date Finland became a state was when the public authorities had become strong enough to assert themselves through the territories of the state without the assistance of the foreign troop. That was May 1918. However, the requirement of effective government does not strictly apply in the case of a newly established state. So a state does not cease to exist when it is temporarily deprived of an effective government as a result of civil war. For example, Somalia has no central government for over a decade, but its status as state has not been affected. And the last requirement under Article 1 of the Montevideo Convention is the capacity to enter into relation with other states. So capacity in this context refers to legal competency. It is left to the discretion of the entity to choose which international person it desires to engage in relations with. It is also referred to the ability of the government of a nation to interact with other governments. It also can be said that membership of the United Nations and other international organizations is the best evidence of engaging in foreign relations. Capacity to enter into relation with other states is also connected to the issue of independence. Factual and legal aspects of independence where the first one, Factual independence refers to physical ability to govern the territory without direction from another state. While legal independence means there is no other valid claims by other states to govern that territory. So it emphasizes two elements. There must be a territory and it must not be subjected to the authority of another state. That is for declarative theory. Now we move to constitutive theory. Under this theory, a state only becomes a state when it is recognized by other states. It means the entity which has all the common characteristic of state is not a state unless it is recognized by other state. So therefore, recognition constitutes statehood. And there are two types of recognition express and implied recognition. For express recognition, it is made by formal declaration or statement, while for implied recognition, the recognition is inferred or implied from certain act, for example, from diplomatic relation or from a conclusion of bilateral treaty. However, Constitutive theory is not very conclusive because it says recognition constitutes statehood, but it fails to indicate the numbers of state required to recognize a new political entity before the latter become a state. So it brings us to the next issue, whether or not satisfying the Montevideo criteria alone is enough to be a state or if recognition is also necessary. So, according to declarative theory, as we discussed before, this declarative theory provides that a state is a state if it satisfies all the conditions under the Montevideo Convention. This is in line with Article 3 of the same convention, 
where it says the political existence of the state is independent of recognition by other states. And Article 6 says recognition is merely signifies that state accept the personality of the other. However, declarative theory fails to adequately describe the creation of states in international practice. This is because there is entities in the world already satisfying all criteria under Article 1 but does not get benefit of being a state. For example, Moldovan territory of Transnistria. This non-state entity has essentially been independent since the collapse of the Soviet Union. It has territory, it has permanent population, it has a government, and it has engaged in relations with other states, for example, Russia. Notwithstanding its meeting with the Montevideo criteria, it does not participate in international affairs because it lacks recognition. As of 2011, Transnistria has been recognized only by three other mostly non-recognized states, which are Abkhazia, Artsakh, and South Ossetia. We compare Transnistria to the case of Vatican City, where Vatican City had been created in 1929 as a result of the Lateran Pacts between the Catholic Church and Italy. Vatican City is a small city, a small state. It has only 110 acres, 800 population, which is not permanent, comprising the main papal officials and employees who are allowed to reside. The recognition of the Vatican as state, especially by Italy that surrounds it, allows it to operate even it does not completely satisfying the Montevideo Convention. The next issue is about not matured statehood. Take, for example, the case of Palestine. As for 2019, Palestine had received at least 138 recognition of states and statehood from members of United Nations. However, there is no evidence indicates Palestine is already a state. And the reason is because they cannot serve regulatory function because they lack authority over a territory or people. It has no effective control, in other words. So for conclusion, in order to become a state, declarative and constitutive theory are complementing each other. An entity need to fulfill the criteria of statehood under Montevideo Convention, as well as receive the recognition from other states. Till we meet again in the next video. Thank you.